center camera, Eric? Okay. Okay. Center camera, Eric. Okay. Okay. The drums there. He is an Anglican. Center camera, Eric. Okay. Okay. Good morning and welcome to St. John's Episcopal Church in Ellicott City, Maryland, as we gather this morning for uh, the bishop to speak to us about Lambeth and the good work of the Anglican Communion. I'm the Reverend Katrina Grussell, Associate for Pastoral Care and Episcopal Chaplain at UMBC, and we're delighted that you can join us good this morning. Good morning and welcome to St. John's Episcopal Church in prayer. O oh God, by your grace, you have called us in this diocese to a goodly fellowship of faith. Bless our bishop, Robert and Eugene, and other clergy, and all our people. Grant that your word may be truly preached and truly heard, your sacraments faithfully administered and faithfully received. By your spirit, fashion our lives according to the example of your Son, and grant that we may show the power of your love to all among whom we live. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Welcome, Bishop. Okay, so I'll start again. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. <laughs> now that uh, everyone can hear that uh, to this open forum on the 15th Lambeth Conference that just concluded days ago, ago 
at Canterbury, England. I was mentioning before that this is one of the uh, uh, thermoses that uh, was given to all of the bishops and spouses, and I used it very much, very, uh, a whole lot during that conference. It has been my privilege as your bishop to attend two Lambeth conferences in my tenure. The first in 2008, I had been consecrated bishop in June, June, 20, uh, June 28 of 2008. Two weeks later, I was at Lambeth Conference of Bishops. Among the highlights of that time was when Sonia and I were walking in Buckingham's Palace Garden. The Queen had a garden party. You may know that the Queen of England is the temporal head of the Church of England. And so she invited the 800 or so bishops to her garden for a party. Believe you me, it's a big garden. She could handle it. <laughs> While Sonia and I were traipsing along in the garden, uh, a gentleman came to us dressed very neatly, very smartly, and he introduced himself as a chamberlain. There were more titles in the Anglican communion than people. And this chamberlain said to Sonia and I, would you like to meet the queen? And I, of course, got out my diary. I learned how to say that. And I was going to say, have your people call my people. We, no, yes. <laughs> and so he took a bit of information about us um, and how we didn't know at the time that of those 800 and so uh, bishops, only about six or eight or so were picked out beforehand to actually have a conversation with the queen. And so when the time came for the garden party, the trumpets, yes, there were really trumpets that played. And then the beef eaters came out. Yes, the beef eaters. They looked like beef eaters. And you wouldn't know anything about what they look like because you don't get the gin. <laughs> and then the queen comes out, accompanied by the Archbishop of Canterbury, then Rowan Williams. And so we were, did as we were instructed. We, um, we stepped out about 20 steps in front of the big crowd. And she went down the line. And... After a few minutes, there we were, introduced to the Queen of England by the Archbishop of Canterbury. There's a photo of it in my office. I'll put it up for eBay later. For anybody. <laughs> so that was my first uh, conference, and that was a highlight, but it was a grueling conference then, and much more contentious than the Lambeth Conference now. And this, this one, at the just concluded conference in Canterbury, England. This conference of Anglican bishops usually occurs once every decade. But the twin crises of, one, divisions in the Anglican communion over human sexuality, and two, the COVID-19 pandemic, it delayed the 15th Lambeth Conference until this year. The conference is at once, at the same time, a family reunion of sorts, of um, ecclesiastically related and far-flung family members on the one hand, and on the other hand, a semi-synodical gathering of bishops with a wide range of views on various topics who yet try to speak to the world with one voice. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> I'd like to give you some background on what the Anglican Communion is and how it came to be. It's very important when we consider the significance of the Lambeth Conference. And I want to share with you some of my experiences and learnings from the conference, and particularly what may be learnings for the Diocese of Maryland. And then we'll have... Some a time for questions and answers, and hopefully some conversation about the pressing issues facing the, this family of churches today. So, first of all, what is the Anglican Communion? Anglican Communion is one of the world's largest Christian communities. It has close to 100 million members in more than 165 countries around the globe. The communion is organized into a series of provinces and extra-provincial areas. The provinces 
are subdivided into dioceses and the dioceses into parishes. In the Episcopal Church, the Episcopal Church is one of the provinces of the Anglican Communion. What is a bit confusing to some around the globe is that we've subdivided our province into, yes, nine provinces. <laughs> uh, but those are local provinces. There are 42 provinces. The Anglican Communion, each with a head bishop called a primate. Primate, not primate. <laughs> the primates of the Anglican Communion are not Neanderthals. And they're usually designated as archbishop, commonly called the most reverend, so-and-so. Or in the case of the Episcopal Church and a few other provinces that have taken the word Episcopal, their primate is called the presiding bishop. And then there are five extra provincial areas that report directly to the Archbishop of Canterbury. Some provinces are national, like the Church of England, or the Church of Scotland, or the Church of Jamaica, or, uh, or, or the, uh, uh, the Diocese of uh, Papua New Guinea. Those are national provinces. Others are regional, and some countries will have a few provinces. The Episcopal Church is a bit of an anomaly. The Episcopal Church is a province, but we are not merely national. We are international, the Episcopal Church. More about that later. All have in common a reciprocal relationship with the see, that is, the primate, of Canterbury. And, they, and we all recognize the Archbishop of Canterbury as the communion's spiritual head. So the Archbishop of Canterbury, one of two provinces actually in the Church of England, the uh, province of York and the province of Canterbury. He, of course, is the spiritual head of that province but also of the entire communion. Even though we recognize the Archbishop of Canterbury as the spiritual head, who has the central authority in the Anglican communion? I'm not going to treat this as a class, but this will be on the test. The answer is there is no central authority in the Anglican communion. All of the provinces are autonomous and free to make their own decisions in their own ways, guided by recommendations from the four instruments, sometimes called the instruments of unity, more commonly called the instruments of communion. Here are the four instruments. One, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Two, the Lambeth Conference of all the invited bishops from around the globe. Three, the primates meeting, all 42 of them. And, and four, the Anglican Consultative Council, which is a more representative body of representatives from each of the provinces. Anglican Consultative Congre uh, Council, I believe, meets only about every three years. It's a little flu fluid. The primates do not meet very often. The primates' meetings may be once a year. It depends on how they're feeling about each other. And the, and the Lambeth Conference, of course, as I mentioned earlier, about every 10 years or so. So what are the historical roots of the Anglican Communion and the Episcopal Church? Just a few minutes on a brief history lesson the beginnings of the Church of England from which the Episcopal Church derives dates to at least the second century after Christ when merchants and other travelers 
first brought Christianity to England. Customary to regard St. Augustine of Canterbury's mission to England in 597 as marking the formal beginning of the church under papal authority, under the Pope from Rome, as it was to be throughout the Middle Ages. So, some date the Anglican Communion to 597, Canterbury, St. Augustine, a missionary there. In its modern form, the church dates from the English Reformation of the 16th century, when royal supremacy was established and the authority of the papacy, the Roman Catholic Pope, was repudiated. So with the advent of British colonization, the Church of England was established on every continent of the world. In time, these churches gained their independence, but retained connections with the Mother Church and the Anglican Communion. The Church of England initially separated from the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, in the 16th century during the reign of King Henry VIII, and you know that story about his marital difficulties but it has always considered itself as a reformed continuation of Catholic Christianity. By Catholic, we mean with a small c. The great Catholic tradition in the Middle East, it's called the Latin Church, Church in the West. Anglican worship outside of Britain began first in 1578 in Canada. Again, follow the traders, and the missionaries. The Anglican Communion itself traces much of its growth to the older mission societies and organizations of the Church of England, such as the Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge, the SPCK, the, so the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts, the USPG, then the Church Missionary Society, CMS. And when you talk to the bishops in these various provinces, they most, mostly outside of North America, they will tell you which missionary society began the Anglican expression in that province. This will also tell you something else. Each of these missionary societies had their own emphases. Some were more Anglo-Catholic, some were more evangelical, and some brought church. Hence, you can see the beginnings of different conceptions of what the church is from the very beginning. So, uh, in 1783, coming to America, following the American War of Independence, the parishes of Connecticut elected Samuel Seabury as their bishop. Because the Church of England could no longer ordain him, he turned to the Scottish Episcopal Church, a move seen by some as the beginnings of the Anglican Communion with autonomous member churches. If you looked at a flag of the Episcopal Church, is there one here, Katrina? Over there, if you saw that flag unfurled, you will see um, that, um, oh, the Scottish, the St. Andrew's Cross, on the Episcopal Church, uh, Church's flag, symbolizing our roots, the first bishop ordained was from the Scottish Church, the Scottish branch. And as you know, Scotland had its own issues with England. Uh, and then quickly, I'm getting to Claggett here. In 1787, Samuel Provost of New York and William White of Pennsylvania were elected bishops and consecrated by the Church of England, motivated, in no, no doubt, by the Scottish non-jurors consecration of Samuel Seabury four years earlier. So here you have three bishops in America, soon to be four, one ordained by the Scottish, those two others by England. 
And then comes Thomas John Claggett. I don't know. Ah, yes. This, this plaque, of, and I'll read it, it's very short. In memory of Tom, Thomas John Claggett, the first bishop of Maryland, and the first bishop consecrated in the United States of America. And he was chaplain of the United States Senate. And notice this, a direct descendant of George Claggett, three times mayor of Canterbury, and alderman of the city between 1599 and 1638. This plaque is fairly prominently placed in one of the aisles of Canter Canterbury Cathedral. And I took a photo of it in 2008 and again uh, just a few weeks ago. He was a descendant of the Lord Mayor of Canterbury. Very prominent family. When he was ordained, hands were laid on him by Samuel Seabury and William White and, and um, Samuel Provost, which brought together those two strains, the Scottish and the English, in the American church. Another way of saying it is this. When Maryland was instituted, the Diocese of Maryland, it was an occasion for ecumenism. We brought together strands that had been fighting in the Anglican Communion. So, uh, over the years, the, again, these national churches gained independence from the Church of England and the Anglican Communion gradually became a global family <coughs> of national and regional churches. So what is the, the Lambeth Conference? Lambeth Conference of Anglican Bishops began when the British Empire was the dominant power in the world. Very important to know that. The outsized influence of the Church of England today on the Anglican Communion cannot be underestimated. And not just because the Archbishop of Canterbury is universally recognized as the spiritual head. I find it amazing that churches from 165 countries all agree, not by a constitution that we all hold, but we all agree we're going to go to England and we are going to be led by an English bishop in some way. The colonial descendants of the British Empire are bound together by its imperial roots in empire. Only secondarily because we are part of the worldwide Jesus movement as our presiding bishop Michael Curry descri describes global Christianity. Yet anomalies abound. I mentioned before the Episcopal Church based in the United States with 99 dioceses. But we are in, in ourselves a global entity with 13 overseas dioceses in other countries and territories. The Diocese of Taiwan, Puerto Rico, Ecuador, two Ecuadorian um, uh, uh, dioceses, I think they were recently brought together in the Episcopal Church, Venezuela, Colombia, Honduras, and I'm not going to name them all, but it'll just give you a sense of that. And then going into Europe, the American Episcopal Churches of Europe with its own bishop, with churches in Belgium, Italy, Spain, uh, that's all English, France, Germany. And so... <laughs> We are actually, in several ways, perhaps, the most influential province in the Anglican Communion. Why? Because of the American Empire. The American Empire, and this was expressly named as such at the recent Am Lambeth Conference. The British Empire and now the American Empire. It stretches over the entire globe with immense 
and unparalleled political, military, financial, and cultural power. The world is defined in large part by American culture and values. And this reality lies at the heart of much of the tensions in the Anglican Communion today. You know, it's said that um, financially, economically, when the American economy sneezes, the West rest of the world gets a cold. Unmatched military power, cultural power. Every country in the world can name American shows, TV shows, movies. That's power and its influence over the world. When the American church, commonly referred to in the Anglican communion as tech, the Episcopal church, and you hear it a lot, you always say, tech, oh, you're a tech bishop. Um, when, the, when tech speaks or acts, for better or for worse, the rest of the communion feels the need to respond, given our outsized financial and cultural influence in the communion. This, of course, sometimes brings admiration and gratitude. Ah, oh, the Americans. But more often, American influence brings a strange combination of admiration, envy, resentment, and yes, real anger. Because also with that power, it's very easy for a nation or a church to say, well, this is what we're going to do, and we're going to do it no matter what you say because we have the power to do it. What is the moral authority of the Lambeth Conference? I believe it's important to remember our collective rootedness in separating 16th century from a much more hierarchical Roman Catholic Church. For all of the appearances in our church of Roman Catholic polity, fighters, idols, healing, <laughs> spiritual and ecclesiastical powers granted to bishops, canonical structures, dioceses, and the like. For all of that, Anglicans generally and Episcopalians in particular are very suspicious of individuals holding too much power. We get nervous when institutions tell us what to do. Put it positively, we give great sway as Episcopalians to individual conscience in making moral decisions in our DNA. We don't trust a church to tell us what to do and to think in all of the great moral questions. They guide us. They make suggestions. I can go to any parish in this, in this diocese. And by the way, I'm the chief liturgical officer in the diocese. And I can say in any parish, I want you from now on to do your passing of the peace in this way. At that point, many of the rectors and the, and, the, and the vestries will say, well, thank you for sharing, Bishop. <laughs> That's a mighty fine suggestion. <laughs> but, it's some, it, but it's an interplay because, yes, because of uh, the position that I have in chief liturgical officers, rectors do indeed ask permission to use various liturgies, as they should, but it's not a tyrannical kind of power. I have to say all this because when I finally, I'm going to wind up in a few minutes, you can see how this affects others in the communion when they see how we operate. We are more individually conscious, uh, uh, individually conscious than many other cultures and churches. You know this when you travel. Most other cultures in the world think family first, community first. It's us, it's we. We as Americans tend to think, I. What's good for me? What do I want? 
So when we speak of the moral authority of the church, our branch of Anglican Christians shy away from such talk. We like dialogue, mutual discernment, more than authorities. That is precisely why we brush up against such talk as the authority of the so-called instruments of communion over us. Anglicans, Anglicanism tends to love Catholic spirituality and piety, but not Catholic authority and power. His forward to the book, The First Lambeth Conference in 1967, the then Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael Ramsey, disavowed the creation of any Anglican organ of formal authority, even as he affirmed that, quote, through the series of Lambeth conferences, a growing undefined moral authority has been felt always within the Anglican churches and sometimes beyond them. Not a central moral authority, but there's a growing sense that the Lambeth conferences have some authority. That authority, however, was non-juridical, that is, non-binding, because Modern church laws took the form of resolutions with no legal force. The end result has been the creation by Lambeth Conferences of a non-coercive body of non-binding decisions in which successive conferences appeal to earlier conferences as a precedent alongside other normative Christian sources such as the Bible and tradition of the early church. So I'll just end this section with this. It's a quote. Anglican ecclesiology has since at least 1867, the first of the Lambeth Conferences, found itself in a near constant state of creative ecumenically influential flux. Among those churches in the Reformation in which Catholic traditions and institutions in part continue to exist, the Anglican communion occupies a special place. That is true. Roman Catholic family of churches and the Orthodox family of churches is one expression. And then the Reformed and the Lutherans. And the Reformed, Lutherans, Methodists, Baptists, Pentecostals, they are all thought to be Protestant. You're either Protestant or you're Catholic or in especially other parts of the world if you're Christian Orthodox. But who are those Anglicans? The Anglicans have a particular spot. We are somewhere in the middle. And that, of course, is called the via media. We love the middle, the middle ground between Catholicism and Protestantism, between structure and freedom, between autonomy and interdependence. We hold those things in tension, and that's our special place. Why don't I stop right there and ask if there are any comments or questions before I I, I go into some personal experiences at Lambeth. Comments, questions at all? Yes. Ah, okay, here, uh, this is the opening worship service of the Anglican Communion, and you see the gentleman there prostrate on the, on the steps. That is during the prayer of confession. That is the Archbishop of Canterbury. He was the only one who lied prostrate in that position. There is the, the opening service. Uh, this is in the choir part. I was uh, in the lower part with the, um, with the rest of the people. And in fact, why don't, uh, can you play that clip of um, that worship service? Just a bit of music there. I, I uh, did this video that she's going to cue up here. 
acquire from I can hear it better online. By the way, you see me in a mask uh, there. Almost all of the American bishops wore masks the entire time. Some of the English ones, some of the Canadian ones. By far, most of the other bishops did not. You might imagine, and it is true, some of the bishops came down. And some of the American ones. After. I actually left a bit early because I uh, actually have a little procedure uh, Friday, and I had to do some pre-work for that, some outpatient uh, procedure. But also, when I, I, um, I found out, you know, where, where is so-and-so, where they were isolating because they had tested positive, and I knew I had to come back not positive. <laughs> One of the things you might uh, when a, a, you might be curious about, the big issue, of course, I said, was human sexuality, human dignity. And there was a, uh, the conference almost came apart some way early on when somehow in the documents there was a call for a vote to reaffirm a resolution from 1998 at that Lambeth conference. That resolution, commonly called 110, Resolution 110 out of, uh, the, of that conference, it called for this. It commends the church and the subsection or report on human sexuality. In view of the teaching of scripture upholds faithfulness in marriage between a man and a woman and lifelong union, and believes that abstinence is right for those who are not called to marriage. Obviously, for those who are oriented to the same sex, you're out. Nothing. No relationships. Nothing. But then the second part of it recognizes that there are among us persons who experience themselves as having a homosexual orientation. This is language from 1998. Many of these members of the church, many, many of these are members of the church and are seeking the pastoral care, moral direction of the church, and God's transforming power for the living of their lives and the ordering of relationships. We commit ourselves to listen to the experience of homosexual persons, and we wish to assure them that they are loved by God and that all are baptized, believing, and faithful persons regardless of sexual orientation, are full members of the body of Christ. Again, the language is dated. But on the other hand, homosexual practice is incompatible with Scripture. But we're called to love those of such orientation. A, I very much reject that we, them kind of language. Because it that, that's part of the problem. There were more provinces in the Anglican Communion that says we don't have a problem with that here because same-sex orientation is an import from America or the West in general because of its, uh, its general immorality, secularism and materialism. And yet it denied and there's still churches and provinces today that absolutely discriminate against persons of same-sex orientation. And so when they're calling for a, um, an upholding of that resolution, it's only really the first part that they're concerned about. Because even their own church practices are not welcoming same-sex persons and 
they are not challenging some national governments that are persecuting persons of uh, same-sex orientation, even to the point of death. Well, at the beginning, um, when it became apparent, oh, they wanted us to vote on that, then we're, we're getting the American bishops especially, but still some from around the world saying, no, we didn't come here to vote on that. It wasn't just Americans. There are an increasing number of those around the Anglican Communion that know that are liberalizing on that issue. But also a vote could be spun in, in many ways because it was hoped that, oh, if we, came, if we put this to a vote, Maybe of the 650 or so bishops who were there, maybe 80 or 90 percent of them are going to vote to uphold that resolution, and it'll and you'll readily see that it's just basically Americans, Canadians, New Zealanders, and some others uh, in the West who are who are um, who have liberalized on that. The other problem with a vote, though is that we go to the issue of authority. The presiding bishop doesn't tell any bishop how to vote on any issue. And we are given license as bishops to run our dioceses in the way that we think best within the canons of the whole church. There are other provinces of the, uh, of the Anglican Communion when the primate or the uh, archbishop says, this is what you will say, this is what you will do, you will attend or not attend, and you will vote this way or that on certain issues. It's a much more hierarchical view of the authority of the bishop, and especially the archbishop. And so three provinces did not attend at all. Nigeria, which is the largest province in the Anglican Communion. I now forget the numbers, but I think it's something like 20 million Anglicans in Nigeria. They did not come. None of them came because the archbishop said you cannot come. Uganda did not attend. Rwanda did not attend. Even in Kenya, now about half, maybe half of the Kenyan bishops came. The archbishop did not come because of the issue of sexuality. But he did not prevent any other bishops from coming. They're, they're much more democratic in their decision making. We have a relationship with the Diocese of Nakuru in Kenya. I visited there a few times, preached to their cathedrals. We've had the, their bishop come here. We were making plans for there to be more cross-pollination uh, I wanted some seminarians to come there because, man, they know how to plant churches and grow them. We could learn so much from them. And, um, and he was going to have some of his priests come and experience in Maryland. He, like all of the Kenyan bishops, is much more conservative than I am. And he does not feel, as I do, on these issues of human identity and sexuality. And yet, he says, we're we're brothers and sisters. We're siblings. We're a communion. And let's learn from each other. And, um, and so uh, there it is. But even in that province, there are about, I believe, five million, five or six million Anglicans just in Kenya. How many Anglicans are in America? Maybe two million. So notice I said, outside influence. Why so much influence when actually you're in the bottom third of number of members in the provinces? The American Empire. And it causes resentment. Why should we listen to these Americans and Canadians and many in the Church of England and the West where the church is shrinking? We are growing, but yet we don't feel the influence in the Anglican. Again, that's my take on things, not others. But were there other matters besides human dignity and human sexuality that the conference addressed? Yes. Bishops addressed 
a number of topics of grave concern to the world and to the church. And I'm going to name it. We spent days on these. Mission and evangelism. Safe church, free from sexual exploitation and harassment. That was a major thing. Because even in the Anglican Communion, there are some bishops who are charged with sexual harassment, but the victims don't know where to go. And many of the churches have no policies in place for what happens if you are harassed. Anglican identity. We talked a lot about Christian reconciliation, Christian unity, and interfaith relations. Discipleship. Environmental degradation and climate change, poverty, hunger, and violence. Those are not going to get headlines, but we actually spent 95% of our time together talking about those issues, not sexuality. Issues of human identity and sexuality did not consume us. It would for the press, but not for us. Finally, because of the uproar or whatever happened, we did not vote on that resolution on human identity and sexuality. Instead, we issued a call saying, where we are in the Anglican Communion is we're divided on that. And some hold to that 1998 resolution and some do not. I will tell you, the American church bishops were ecstatic. We did not expect that. And many of my sibling bishops, especially those who uh, came with uh, their spouses, they were in tears, in tears of joy. We will see what will happen to some other provinces in the communion because this conference did not make a firm stand on issue of sexual identity. I believe that the most honest thing that could happen, in fact, it happened. Just the statement that we're divided. But we were agreed to move forward together. Hey. What are some learnings? First of all, the process of calls Calls were issued at the end of the, most of the days, not resolutions. I thought it was a positive one for the church at large, and it's worthy to be emulated. And I want to talk more with um, our diocesan council, with all of you all, and the standing committee to say, might there be another way that the Diocese of Maryland can call attention to some issues without voting up and down on resolutions. No resolutions were voted up or down at this conference. And yet, there was powerful witness about many of the issues. Why must the church speak only legislatively rather than another way? We don't have time here to say, say what, what came behind these calls, but there were groups of people that the Archbishop of Canterbury had commissioned to work on these issues and come up with papers with suggestions for, uh, for how might we call the whole church to act on these issues. When those calls came, we debated those and around tables, small groups, and some were reported back and says, well, we don't like this, we don't like that. And so they're going to take the, all of the comments from the, uh, the, the conference and then reissue these calls and saying, here it seems to be the mind of the church on climate change, on evangelism, on uh, interfaith relations, on all, and, and, and even on human identity and sexuality. And my prediction is that they will be well received by 90% of the church without an up or down vote. When you vote on a resolution and say it passes by 60%, have you resolved anything? 
not a resolution. About the best, you can say, but when we, when we took votes on um, reparations, much to my surprise and, and glee, those votes were, uh, first there was not a single no vote on affirming the principle, and then when we voted on the money, that was about 86, 87 percent of the vote. I want us to explore um, finding ways to see what's on people's minds that we need to be speaking on or acting on. And let's get groups of people together and do the work of not just a resolution with explanation, but also, as with the calls, some good biblical and theological grounding for all of it. And you actually have several pages to digest on that call beforehand. And let's talk about we, how we might be able to affirm those calls or say no, as we did in the, at, at Lambeth. There were some of them, you know, the, the archbishop just says, okay, we're not going to vote, but, um, but if you generally think that this call is going in the direction that you want, say nothing. Then there will be silence or maybe a few people, no. And then he says, well, or maybe on this one you think, no, you're, you're right in the middle, and you think it needs a whole lot more work. If that's so, um, say I. Or something. And that happened for a few of them. And, and, then, and then it's like, or for this call, you don't feel that this is where the church needs to go. If that's so, say no. And there were a few occasions where the whole room went, no! <laughs> and the biggest no was around I'll use shorthand, a more hierarchical structure. That, that's my term for it, but it, it, was for, um, it was for a greater sense of synod, synodality. I used that word earlier. Synod, S-Y-N-O-D. So syn, synodality is the church acting as a synod, making resolutions and legislation. And it was pretty widespread from across, across the, the Anglican Communion. We said, we don't want that. We want to live in that tension of autonomy, but yet we are interdependent. We need each other. So that's one take back I want to um, uh, call us to. How might we do convention without resolutions? There may be some things we have to vote on that are matters of administrative, uh, administrative matter, but, um, but not otherwise. Is it a waste of time and money for bishops to gather together in this way? It cost a lot. It really did. But if the leaders of the church never meet, how are we the church? Or parish? What if you, uh, your parish, your congregation, what if your priest never went to a gathering of other priests in this diocese? How do you think that might affect your church? And what does communion mean? In Anglicanism, no single congregation lives alone. And, and the Episcopal Church, and in fact, just about everywhere in the Anglican Communion, all of the giving of that church doesn't stay in that church. But we have common mission, common concerns. And so on a larger scale, if your bishop never actually sat down with other bishops at some point in the Anglican communion, to what extent are we Anglican? Does it matter to have a global focus? I think it does. The importance of seeing the church from a global perspective. For instance, one quickly realizes at the Lambeth Conference that the Anglican communion is not mostly white and wealthy. Get there. North America and Europe clearly are not in the majority in world Christianity. 
And when you spend two weeks, almost two weeks, with Anglicans around the world, you can see the difference. Many years ago, when I told friends, uh, when I became an Episcopalian, and they were wondering, why are you joining that white church? And I would say, I was actually joining a mostly black church. I was referring to the fact that most, the most common demographic profile of a typical Anglican is a young African woman. The Lambeth Conference is the only vehicle for most bishops to really experience the diversity of the church. I am so glad that Maryland is a part of this worldwide family of churches. And now this is really going to be a finally for me. Go on and on about a number of things. What are some of the personal highlights for me at this conference? What I mentioned was the uplifting services with vibrant music. One of the things I also want to talk with you all about in this diocese is, um, is maybe a revitalization and a beefing up of a diocesan liturgical commission, diocese worship commission. Because um, my eyes were open to some other ways of being Anglican and worshiping together. So I want to explore some of that with you. Uh, it, I, will tell you, I will say this, in the Anglican world, more Anglican provinces actually regularly begin the Eucharist after the opening acclamation with a very brief confession. We are one of the anomalies that don't. We wait till after the sermon where we confess the fact that we're still Christian after having heard that sermon. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, it's something to be explored. Other highlights for me, meeting my sister and brother bishops from all over the world, doing Bible study with leaders from Papua New Guinea, my small group that I met with. I had the primate of Papua New Guinea. Um, and there was uh, the bishop of Myanmar, Burma. Oh my gosh, you should hear the stories. And the incredible, courageous witness that Anglicans around the world are, are uh, giving witness to in their countries that's putting their life and people at risk. Who are the bishops that are in my small group? Their lives were at risk by the things they were saying. I can make a statement and, you know, probably not. The primate of Kenya, I'm, I'm sorry, no, not, uh, the bish uh, one of the bishops of Kenya was in my group. The primate of West Indies, based in Jamaica. Bishop in Canada and a bishop in England. Can you pull up... Um, just a few conversations. Hello, Bishop Sutton here again from my Bible study group here at Lambeth. And I want to introduce you to my Lambeth Bible study friends. Hello, it's uh, Bishop John Stevens uh, from the Diocese of New Westminster in Canada, which is based in, uh, in Vancouver. Um, Really enjoying being here at Lambeth. Great to have this Bible study group. But uh, mostly, I think what I appreciate is the relationships that are forming and the connections uh, made in, in Christ uh, by gathering here and uh, hearing from voices all around the world. So uh, great to share that with you. Hello, I'm Howard Gregory, Archbishop of the West Indies, Bishop of Jamaica, the Cayman Islands. My second Lambeth conference. And um, I've enjoyed the relationship shared in the Bible study group but the closer. by the conference discussion. What I'm dealing with is a great appreciation of the breadth and scope of the Anglican communion, which I think has been well represented, whether in liturgy, in our plenary, 
and in our Bible studies as we bring together different views and perspectives of the faith as advocates. Yes. Hmm. Here's the Kenyan bishop talking about the effects of climate change and his diocese. His people can't eat. They're, they're trying to survive. Congregated, it depends on who you are talking about. There would be those who would understand that there are embedded connections between uh, African realities and global paradigms. There will be those in the villages who have no clue around the connections. Why are their farms not producing anymore? Why have the rains delayed? Why is there no flooding? So missing those connections would be remote, uh, remote for them. So they, I would say the perceptions are quite uh, varied. However, the general impression is that the West is uh, privileged. Uh, it's, it's rich. Um, people don't laugh. Can you pause that? Well, it's a little hard to hear. I was across the way trying to uh, uh, angle my can uh, camera so I sit wouldn't see the Bishop of Westminster, New Westminster's feet. Uh, bishop Joseph Wandera from Mimisas in Kenya, very good man, learned man. Uh, he's some hundreds of miles west of Nairobi, and he was basically saying there, my farmers can't grow anything. The rains won't come. Food security, I, he spends a lot of his time trying to find food for his As bishop, they were looking to him. And he was also saying in his very kind way that the perception is that the West us are privileged and have everything and we don't care that much. Here when you talk about climate change, or climate crisis, it's so easily political here. It's not in most of the rest of the Anglican world. They feel the effects. Even in England there, very strange thing. This is England. We're in Canterbury, and I think that whole time there was one little downpour for about a couple of minutes. This was very strange. England. And every day you see the clouds, sometimes dark clouds, just kind of hanging over, but it never rained. It was almost like that new movie, Nope. If you haven't seen it, see it because clouds figure big, uh, heavily in that movie. Um, so um, I, 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 you couldn't hear it all, but it was, um, uh, it was a lament. And you heard it very much. One way I would put it is this. A lot of the rest of the world wants to know Will the American church and those in the West change anything in their lifestyle so that others can live? Then we have the Bishop of St. Edmundsbury in Ipswich. I don't know if the English ever laugh at themselves for their... Uh, uh, they have great names, and I don't know if you can pull it up. Well, when you do, whenever you do, just play it while I, while I go on. But uh, uh, that English bishop was saying things are topsy turvy there on economic dislocation. He says he and his church, uh, his churches, are feeding more people now in emergency situations than ever, and so did the bishop of New Westminster in Canada. So many of us in our dioceses, how, how long is this sustainable? The, um, the opening address of the Archbishop of Canterbury, oh, there he is, there's the, there's the Bishop of Ips Ipswich. 
Very good man. He used to teach in a Hello, seminary. My name's Martin Seeley. I'm the Bishop of St. Edmundsbury in Ipswich, which is the county of Suffolk in eastern England. Uh, what I'm going to be bringing back from this conference is, first of all, a, an extraordinary sense of fellowship with uh, people from around the world, bishops and bishop spouses that uh, I've met uh, for most for the first time, and the sense of a uh, common purpose that we share. And secondly and specifically are bring back a renewed determination and a renewed energy and uh, level of insight around the issue of climate change and how we address that crisis together okay. so that was a highlight for me um, that that small group and i couldn't get everybody on uh, camera for that day the Bible studies for the small groups and the whole conference was based on the first letter of Peter. I never really realized how much First Peter spoke to the issues of the church today. We mined this letter for two weeks, and it actually speaks to almost every issue that we're, we're, that we're faced with. You might be able to get this, uh, this guide, the study uh, guide, online, from, and maybe think about it for your churches. I'm, I'm thinking about how we can use it in the diocese. Uh, the, the big thing is this. He's addressing an exiled community. They felt exiled and under some persecution, and that you know, they were a minority in this secular pagan world. How do you act, and how do you how are you together when you have so many diverse views? So First Peter, the Archbishop of Canterbury gave daily Bible study lectures on this. Brilliant. His, he also gave three keynote addresses. If you ever get a chance, please go online. You can find the, all of these presentations on YouTube and on Facebook. Maybe play it in a car or something. You know, hook up your phone to it so you can listen to, um, to, to his concerns. He gave very powerful addresses that said the world is in trouble. The world, in many ways, is coming apart. He talked about the fact that we now have unprecedented in human history about a billion displaced people, migrants, who are escaping poverty, hunger, and violence, and climate change. Where are they going to go? Who's going to take them? When their lands become uninhabitable, where will they go? They're increasingly coming to our shores, and if, if their only response is build a big wall, there's no wall in the world that's going to prevent that horde. We talked about technological change and what that meant. Um, increasing numbers of worldwide pandemics. He said, uh, when he, he talked about talks with scientists. He said that pandemic that we experienced the last couple of years, we're going to see more of those. One after another. The theme of this conference was God's church for God's world. We heard a lot about what this church means and what's happening in the world. So the Archbishop of Canterbury gave very, very powerful addresses. Um, and then the, the, the other personal highlight for me was the depth of community and mutual regard that the Episcopal Church bishops have for one another. I'm going to tell you that so many other provinces do not have that same level of love and trust for each other as your bishops do in this province. This is nurtured in no small part by our own presiding bishop, Michael Curry. He talks about love, love, love. <laughs> There's like Michael Curry. Um, and this Gail Harris, she is the suffragan bishop of Massachusetts uh, for now. And um, 
I'll give you uh, uh, an advance word. Well, never mind. I've, we're going to be doing some joint pilgrimages in the next year and a half. But Michael Curry is a, a good leader, and it really makes a difference. Well, 20 years ago, the American bishops were, at, they were fighting to the point of just 50. We still have a variety of views in the Episcopal Church. Not all bishops feel the same about any issue, including human identity and sexuality. But I could go to e any one of them, and we'd hug each other and say, hey, how's it going? And then when we get into groups, we're going to argue it out. But what a way for the church. It is, again, it's nurtured also because we don't have a very hierarchical structure. That can be based on fear. That's not how we do it. Finally, a few things that I could have done without at this conference. One, the University of Kent, where this was, is indecipherable. <laughs> you can't get anywhere. But I, I don't. I've never been on a campus where you can't find anything. You spend 20 minutes trying to find a building that you were at yesterday, but I don't know what happened. Oh, yeah, that's me. At La uh, that is Lambeth Palace in London. Uh, we had a day trip in London, and we all got a boat trip down the Thames. Yeah, Thames. <laughs> With the, the, the Thames. And um, there was a, a good uh, thing at the Lambeth Gardens, too. We spent a lot on um, some environmental issues at that day, including a new project of tree, build, uh, tree planting that we really want to have go all over the Anglican Communion. I'll be talking to our environmental group about how we can plant some more trees uh, as a result of that project. So there we are, Lambeth Palace. Pretty decent place, by the way, and, uh, and clean. I put my finger along the window seal. So I could have done without uh, Kent. I also could have done without fatigue. We were dragging, starting the middle of it. The schedule was unrelenting, and it was brutal. Very few breaks. <coughs> um, and after a while, nobody could simply go to everything. The other thing I could have done without was the, the traditional British breakfast. Beans? Uh, uh, come, come on, Thomas. <laughs> Tomatoes, stewed beans, Love it. Uh, cold stale toast. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> One English bishop said, uh, he did say uh, one evening, I am so, um, so many husbands. He used, uh, he used old traditional language. So many husbands are going to sleep very soundly tonight because they know that their wives have already prepared the next morning's toast. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, and Thomas uh, is from uh, England, right? Yeah, serving at St. John's and um, uh, Western Run. Yeah, he... Uh, I, I have to say about your tribe, your people, the English have a wicked sense of humor. I mean, it's that, you know, the stiff upper lip and not very emotional, effusive, but uh, it was so often you will hear the presiding, uh, the um, Archbishop of Canterbury um, uh, saying such things. Uh, it's just self deprecating humor. That a lot. That, that it, it's really appreciated. So, guys, any comments or questions before I close us? Yes, Chung. I was at Berkeley Divinity School for our convocation a number of years ago. After the last Lambeth Conference, an African bishop was asked to preach. And never forget his sermon. He says the Anglican communion has always been a mess. It's a mess right now. It will always be a mess. Because you bring all these people together, and you share, and it's just a mess. And that's okay. 
So with this one hit, I said, well, it'll be okay. And they'll get together, they'll argue, and yes, with the Anglican Communion, a mess. Charles Cloen, thank you for that. By the way, if you do uh, have a comment or question, introduce yourself before a uh, priest in this diocese. Charlie, thank you for saying that. Yes, it is a mess, but um, it's a beautiful mess. My family is a mess. <laughs> Sutton family event. We, we were going to have a family reunion in August uh, here. We couldn't quite pull it together. We're a mess, but a lovely mess. One of the things also Archbishop Desmond uh, Tutu when he was asked, why, uh, what is an Anglican? He said, we meet. <laughs> you know, he always said things with a twinkle in his eye. God rest his soul. But, um, yeah, we meet and we gather. I frankly prefer the mess that I've, I've learned over time. I also want to make a little confession to you all. I've said it to some people. My first Lambeth conference was pretty traumatic for me. I'd been bishop only two weeks. And when I say traumatic, I meant I actually thought I lost my faith. And I can say this now after 14 years uh, uh, as bishop here. There was a moment during the Anglican communion where I called Sonia up. She had gone uh, back earlier. I called her up and said, Sonia, I've made a great mistake. I can't be bishop, but I don't think this, I don't know what to do. I don't think this church works. Help me figure out how I can call Marilyn and tell him, thank you all. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really appreciate it, but nah, <laughs> nope. I can't do it. It caused a crisis. Why? One was the... Um, level of dishonesty I saw around issues of human identity and sexuality. That was one. But uh, two, also, I think it was, I had an idea of the church, especially at that level, as a well-organized machine <laughs> where, you know, they, and then, you know, somebody's just going to spell it all out. Here's what you do. Here's what you do. And I experienced the Anglican communion as a mess. And that was actually unsettling for me. And I'm thinking, I'm going to be a leader in a mess. Because <laughs> we're trying to, you know, some of it was making stuff up as we go. <laughs> but the other, of course, was the overwhelmingness of it. I, I, I've said to other bishops there, uh, I didn't meet anybody who'd been bishop less than a month, but I would not recommend that. Because uh, you need to be settled in first because it can be quite jarring to see how the sausages are made. <laughs> <laughs> so there it is. It, it's, a, it's a mess. But I, I actually prefer it uh, because it's like my spirituality. It's my life. You know, I have my disciplines. And sometimes they don't work out. <laughs> and sometimes I'm a mess. My church is a mess. Sometimes the world's a mess. But we have a Savior. We have a Lord. And, um, and I think that God doesn't want us to be successful in our eyes on everything that we do and say, because then God can't work with us. We try to build our own Tower of Babels constantly. Reach up to the heavens. God's going to tear them down every time. Nope. You think you're so hot shot now? Okay. Here's another mess. Any others? Bottom line. Oh, yes. Introduce yourself first. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Derek Miller. I'm the rector at St. Peter's in Old Ellicott City, just down the road. Um, thank you, Bishop, for this. I've had a lot of curiosity uh, concern as well. Um, so thank you for, for sharing what you, your experience there. Um, I guess I'll start by way of a comment first and then a question, if I can do that. First is, I, perhaps it's because I'm thinking about this upcoming Sunday's Gospel reading uh, around uh, division. 
uh, right? Uh, Jesus says, you, you know, you think I've come to bring peace, but no, I'm, I'm dividing and dividing these familial relationships. I, I'm cur- I, I, it's just a reflection. Maybe I'm just creating my sermon right now as I'm talking um, about how God is present in the divisions. Uh, and I, that's kind of what I, it's a reflection I'm hearing you say that um, we, we love to sort of fetishize unity um, I think perhaps especially as Ang- Anglicans, um, but that there's perhaps a promise there that, that God is at work, as you mentioned, in the mess of it. Um, so I guess my question, um, and then I have, I'm sorry, I have a question and a recommendation. I'm just, I have the microphone, so here I am. Um, the question is, where, where do you feel like you saw God most present in the mess that you mentioned. I, I heard some of your f- reflections, but is there, there one thing that really stood out to you that perhaps gives you hope um, for the future um, in the midst of the mess? Um, and then I'll, I'll hold my other thought because I'm really curious about your answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Someone wants Someone once asked me, uh, a a group of young clergy, as I looked in the future, was I optimistic about our present structures? And I said, no, I'm not optimistic at all. The way we organize ourselves as followers of Christ is fluid. One of the things that we kept hearing at the Anglican Communion is context. What's your context? And what works in one context doesn't work in another. uh, We see this in our own ministries, lay ministers and clergy members. As uh, many of you know, I have a practice of centering prayer. I'll be leading another retreat on that for... um, a contemplative outreach of metropolitan Washington and Maryland, which I helped co-found 25 years ago. And when I was in um, that diocese to the southeast of us, I mean southwest of us, diocese of Washington, and I went in one parish and I started a couple of centering prayer gatherings. And man, they were just going well. Oh, that was the right time, right place. And then I served a church that was at St. Margaret's. Then I served a church, St. Mary's, which was down the street, maybe a 10, 15-minute walk. And I tried to do the same thing there, and it didn't work. Nobody showed up. Different context. So, uh, no, I'm not optimistic that any one form that your church takes right now and any one program that you institute, I am not optimistic that that will always work everywhere at all times. No optimism, because it's, you know, we're human beings. But you asked me about my hope. I have a lot of hope. I have a lot of hope for the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Communion, and I love it so. And my hope is based on this. What I saw at Lambeth is we were a group of, all told, almost 700 bishops from many contexts, many experiences. But we prayed together. We worshiped together. We strengthened each other and encouraged one another. And we're all taking something back to our dioceses. And if the world can see that, boy, they can do that. Maybe there's more hope for the world. I saw an Anglican communion that was willing to live in the tension and not collapse the tensions. I mentioned uh, some of them earlier. The tension between hierarchy and freedom. We're not going to be totally free for everybody to do everything they want, but we're not going to have a hierarchical uh, view of, in, of, of truth 
as a unidirectional truth from a single person to the many. We live in that tension. We live in the tension in our liturgy between this has ancient roots and we're going to pray the prayer of Hippolytus and Justin Martyr in the second century. But we're also going to update the tension between the old and the new. And I see Anglicanism as particularly well positioned to show how you can do this to the world. We hold on to the old. How many churches, we're in 2022 and we're modern people, well educated and all that. And then after the sermon, on 95% of the Sundays, we stand up and say a creed that was developed seven, 1,700 years ago. The faith of Nicaea, 1,700 years, and we're still saying that creed. We believe. One professor called the church is great nevertheless. That is... No matter what you heard in the sermon, nevertheless, we believe in one God, <laughs> Father of the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. That's a powerful statement. We use old language. We would up, you know, I'm, I'm glad we use that creed and that we don't try to update that creed. Unlike other churches, you know, statements of faith, they keep coming up with new affirmations of faith. We don't do that. We say, no, we're going to hold on. That's an anchor. Those Eucharistic prayers are anchors. We hear scriptures. We hear the most horrific scriptures ever read about things that happen. And at the end, the person says, the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. <laughs> <laughs> we do that. We don't change on it. I like that. I love that. But I also love a church that won't keep its head in the sand and say that we can't uh, just because this was the understanding for 1,900 years. That doesn't mean that we can't have new understandings. If you only listen to one address by the Archbishop of Canterbury, of his three, listen to the last one. He also addresses that issue of, um, of just being able to innovate while holding on to the, uh, the, the old. Some of you have heard me say these kinds of things before. There are some churches that are very good at holding on to the old. And that's what they do. We're not going to ordain women because Jesus didn't have women and his close disciples. We're going to hold on to that. So there, but you try to get any new way of thinking, new ideas. And what the Archbishop of uh, Canterbury was saying this morning, we are Anglicans. We believe in science. And our, our Christian universities are going to study history and geology and astronomy and psychology. Because, and he actually said it is, we actually can know more now than we did in the past. We have more information. In our lifetimes, in this room, we've largely changed our definition of death when people die. We used to believe, yeah, people died when there was no pulse. That was before we had technology that could measure brain activity. And remember, Charlie, uh, you might remember back in 15, no. <laughs> <laughs> remember when we used to say, uh, oh, that person is brain dead. Because when that, end, you know, it's like, oh, they're brain dead. We don't even say that anymore. No, they're dead. They're dead when there's no brain activity. We know that now. They can be brought back to walking this earth. We can know more through science. So uh, read his address. And so we can know more. And so how do we live in tension? But we don't do everything new. And there are some Christian movements and churches that are all about the new. They wouldn't dream of doing the Nicene Creed. Or, or any traditional language about the Lord's Supper on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. 
given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. From Scripture. We don't even change the words on it. There's some uh, that, you know, you think that they've lost their Christian center and their roots because everything is new. New worship, new forms, new readings. Oh, yeah, maybe we'll have an Old Testament, maybe we'll have a Scripture, but nothing that's going to be disturbing. And here are the Anglicans. We're known as, in the Episcopal Church, as a pretty progressive liberal church. We're known for that. That's been a switch, by the way, over over the years, over the generation. But when you actually look at us, we are actually very traditional. We we listen, we read and listen to more scripture than than many of our Protestant brothers and sisters. Hold on to me. So my hope is. I think this is the way in the world. I am comfortable living in the tension and the gray, and it means we're always fighting. We're always going to fight. But I would rather have a good fight than to just sit somewhere and do what I'm told because I'm supposed to and not have to think about it. The best stuff we've ever came up with in the Christian movement has come out of a fight, out of disagreement. Why don't we think slavery is good now? Because we fought. People died for that. Why do we do the Nicene Creed and we say, God, God is a unity. God is a singular and God is also a community. Ugh. That's the faith of Nicaea, 1700. That came after a fight. People lost their lives for that. But that creed came out of a fight. What will come out of our fights is new things. That's my hope. My hope is built on nothing less word and righteousness. My hope is that that will guide this church as we navigate our way through. And we are not going to collapse those tensions. We are not going back. We're not going back to the way the church was 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 400 years ago. We're not going that. But we're not going to go into the future willy-nilly. We're just going to hold on to the basics of our faith. That's why I'm an Anglican, and I have a lot of hope. I think this is what the world needs right now. We need people who are able to do that and have a confidence in the faith of Jesus Christ. Save ourselves and to save the world. I can do that as an Anglican, not have my head in the sand. Huh? Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. Thank you all, and uh, I guess that'll be the last. <laughs> Thank you for writing that. <laughs> royalties, royalties. Please stand if you're here. So, uh, a closing prayer by William Temple, sometime Archbishop of Canterbury around World War II on page 832 in our Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, in this church, in this communion, this Anglican communion, so draw our hearts to you, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills, our wills, that we may be wholly yours, utterly dedicated to you. Then use us, we pray, as you will, your church and your world, always to your glory, the welfare of your people, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, that's what I want. How are you doing? That's good. I haven't seen you in years.
Same place. Same place. Stop it. It can't be. I am, thank you for telling me that because I remember Wayne so much. I miss him. But just to know, yeah, yeah, I, it can be.